yesterday we were talking about some numerical invariants of knots and links, um, such as crossing number we discussed. So there was a long-standing problem here about the additivity of the crossing number. Um, I mean, uh, we discussed that, and then we discussed about um, linking number of oriented links. And I can say maybe in parentheses total linking number if we have more than two components for link. And uh, what else we discussed about the right? Uh, but we just mentioned that it's not invariant under the first Rydomeister move. It is just undoing a, a kink in a strand. So, uh, not invariant under a Rydomeister 1. Uh, but we said that it is still useful for understanding framed knots and links. And uh, actually, DNA topology. Uh, and there was this... Uh, well-known formula for the topology of DNA, which is saying that the linking number of the um, helical boundaries of a DNA is equal to twist number plus the right uh, of the DNA. So here I don't want to review all these uh, numbers, but uh, here, I mean, we extract some uh, functions, well-defined mappings for knots. Uh, and um, they will remain invariant under the equivalence relation that we assume for knots and links, which is called ambient isotopy, or if we work with the projections of knots or knot diagrams, they will be invariant under the Rydomeister moves. And uh, today I want to start with a more uh, sophisticated invariant that is called the knot group. So here maybe I should do this. So, I mean, as time goes by, uh, things get more sophisticated. I mean, we can just, you know, deepen the structure uh, of our range set to, uh, for our knots to get uh, some assigned to some value. And we may use of groups, of course. So, a knot is a loop, non-self-intersecting non loop in three-dimensional space. And uh, the complement of a knot, of a smooth knot, is a non-compact uh, manifold, which is path-connected. Or if you consider the knot inside uh, the 3-dimensional sphere, we can say that it's a compact manifold with a boundary, and the boundary component uh, contains the knotted uh, curve. So here, the information that we can extract from this observation, from this saying, is that we can look at the complement of the knot, and we can check the loop space of the complement. Uh, which is the fundamental group of the complement of the knot. So here, I will assign uh, to my knot the fundamental group of the complement of the knot. And it will be invariant under the MB and isotopy and uh, Rydermeister moves. So um, this is roughly, I mean, a, a summary of what's going on. But uh, how do we understand the loop space of the complement? So actually, maybe I should change the color here. So we choose a base point. Whatever base point you choose, it doesn't matter because the complement is path connected. But here I choose a point uh, in the upper half space. Um, it's cool. And then every arc here, overpassing arc, uh, if you look at, uh, look at our knot from above, uh, it gives us a generator for the fundamental group of the complement. So consider this. Uh, maybe I should consider the loops wrapping around each arc here. All right, so uh, maybe I should write what I'm saying. Each arc of K generates or gives a generator
for the fundamental group of the complement of the knot. Okay, so um, we, I mean, this was observed. Actually, I mean, uh, the fundamental group of the complement was discussed. Uh, it was started to, do, to be discussed in the beginning of 20th century uh, by Tietze and Wittinger. So they did some observations. Actually, they did the observation that we can understand the fundamental group of the complement by some planar representation of the knot uh, in a combinatorial way. I will show it to you. But uh, from this time, I mean, this is like the beginning of the 20th century, from uh, their time to Gordon and Luca time, which is closer to our time, uh, there is an important observation uh, done that the knot group is almost a complete invariant for oriented knots. Where I say that it's, it's a complete invariant because uh, it's complete up to uh, the operation mirror symmetry. So we will be all talking about this, but uh, let's make some quick observations to get started uh, to drive the knot group. Maybe I should just find my Razor, okay, here. All right, so, so what do we know? Suppose that we have two knots that are equivalent to each other, okay? So remember from yesterday's lecture that uh, we know uh, equivalence means that we will have a homeomorphism of, of the three-dimensional space that will take one not to the other one. So here uh, I just lose uh, this definition of uh, equivalence because we assumed orientation preserving homeomorphisms uh, for not equivalence yesterday, right? Suppose that we have any homeomorphism, it can be orientation reversing as well, uh, but uh, this map takes k1 to k2, right? So any homeomorphism. So this is a kind of, you know, losing definition of uh, equivalence on knots, but I, I mean, uh, now let's assume this definition for equivalence. So the first observation that we can do that, if we can do is the following. Uh, so if we have two equivalent knots, then their complement will be homeomorphic, right? If there is a homeomorphism of the three-dimensional space to itself taking one knot to the other one, it's restriction to uh, the complement of the knots will be still uh, be a will be still a homeomorphism, right? So I can write this. Okay, so this is easy to draw, right? Uh, so uh, then. In the 60s, Gordon and Luke uh, observed the converse of this statement. Actually, they just uh, find out that uh, if we have the complements of two knots equivalent to each other up to homeomorphism, then the knots should be uh, equivalent as well. All right? But equivalent in the loosened uh, sense, which means that they can be equivalent up to orientation reversing homeomorphisms, which can change the crossing information or I will say that up to mirror symmetry, okay? So here, uh, there are some more observations, but before that, let's define the knot group, okay? So the knot group of a knot, uh, which is denoted by pi of k, is the fundamental group Of its complement. <laughs> okay, maybe you should mute yourselves. Yeah, yes, thank you. So, can you, can you mute yourself? Yes. So here is a quick uh, example for this. So, suppose that we have the trivial knot in three-dimensional space, and it's. Uh, complementary space will have fundamental group 
the infinite cyclic group, right? I was saying that if we consider the trivial knot in three-dimensional space, and if you look at the complement of the tri uh, trivial knot, you will see that there is just one generator uh, generating the whole space uh, fundamental group, right? So uh, the knot group of the trivial knot is just uh, isomorphic to the infinite cyclic group, which is that. So, uh, but what is the fundamental group of the trefoil knot that we were discussing a lot on yesterday? Right, so that's the question. So it's not really very easy to compute. I mean, you can uh, apply some ciphered van Kampen um, uh, arguments to understand the uh, loop space of the complement. But actually, uh, in three-dimensional space, uh, it needs some work uh, to do. So there is an easier way to find out what's the fundamental group of the complement of the trefoil, or in general, what's the knot group of a knot. So it, it is called the Wirtinger presentation of the knot group, and I will just mention it in a while. But here, let's leave this question here. Uh, and you expect something different than that here, uh, hopefully. But uh, there is a strong observation uh, by Gordon and Luke saying that it should be really different because they are uh, the only knot that can have the trivial um, infinite cyclic group is the unknot. So let's write the theorem. Uh, I think the date was somewhere in uh, sometime in the 60s. I don't really quite remember that. So it is just the converse of the statement of this observation that we did here. So if we have the complements of two knots homeomorphic to each other, then the knots should be also equivalent to each other. Okay? So if R3 minus K1 is homeomorphic to R3 minus K2, then K1 is equivalent to K2 up to mirror symmetry. You can just uh, consider mirror symmetry uh, of a knot as like you are reflecting the knot along a mirror, okay, or along a vertical plane in three-dimensional space. Or in the planar uh, representation, you just change the crossing information. Okay, so let's call this uh, operation mirror symmetry. So this is a diagrammatic representation, but geometrically it is like a reflection through a vertical line in the plane. All right, so the statement is really powerful, right? I mean, uh, we know that if two uh, knots are equivalent to each other up to mirror symmetry, the complements are, of course, I mean, it is direct that uh, complements are homeomorphic, but here we observe that if the complements are homeomorphic to each other, we can just jump to the conclusion that uh, K1 is equivalent to K2. So, up to mirror symmetry. But still, it is powerful. So what do we gain here? But, uh, I mean, it will be useful to use uh, the fundamental group of the complement to understand knots, right? I mean, because if the complements are homeomorphic, then they are uh, knot groups, uh, knot group of K1 and K2 should be uh, isomorphic to each other. Then we can say that K1 is equivalent to K2 from this observation, right? It's not just if K1 is equivalent to K2, their uh, knot groups are the same or isomorphic. Uh, we can say the converse of it. So uh, here I should say that there is another theorem that made this uh, statement possible for prime uh, knots. So it was given by Witten. So we assume two prime knots here. So they are not composite. We also discussed some connected sum operation that uh, gives us composite knots, right? I mean, we take two knots and we just uh, sum them up, uh, up with the uh, given connected sum operation. And um, every knot can be decomposed into its prime uh, particles or prime knots. 
uh, uniquely. So we have here for the statement two prime nodes and we can observe that if uh, their nut groups are isomorphic, then their complements are the same or homeomorphic. Okay, so let's uh, look at the statement in a closer way. So we have two prime nodes and we observe that their uh, nut groups are the same up to isomorphism and then the result is their complements should be the same up to homeomorphism. So here Gordon and Luke added onto this that if we have two homeomorphic complements the nuts should be equivalent to each other, all right? So it could be possible for a composite nut, for example, not a prime nut, that they, are, uh, they have isomorphic uh, nut groups but uh, they are not equivalent to each other. So here primus is important. Um, let me give an example for these, maybe here a counterexample for um, for composite knots. I would write, but I, I don't want to write. So here is an example. Uh, we can consider the granny knot which is obtained by uh, the connected sum of two identical trefoils, if I can draw it here. So here is one trefoil and the other will be this. And let me put the crossing information here so that they will be identical. Okay, then this one is an over crossing. So here, uh, if you orient uh, these two trefoil knots that forms our composite knot, which we call the granny knot, uh, you will see that they are both uh, right-handed trefoils, right? They will have all positive crossings. And there, there is another type of uh, trefoil which we call left-handed trefoil, uh, which has uh, all crossings uh, in negative sign, all right? So this is the connected sum of two uh, right-handed or positive uh, trefoils and we can obtain another knot, composite knot, by, connect, uh, by taking the connected sum of two trefoil knots, but this time uh, they won't be identical and we call it the square knot. So here I draw the same picture. Something like this. And then here they want to be identical. So one is right-handed, the other one will be left-handed, for example. Under, over, where? So you need to practice lots of painting if you want to do not theory. So here it will be going under and then over. Okay, so it's good, I guess. So if you orient uh, your knot, you will see that here on the left-hand side, we see a right-handed trefoil and this will be on the right-hand side, uh, left-handed trefoil, okay? You can see it from the crossing uh, sign information. So here, these two knots are composite knots that are just, you know, their uh, compounds, their sum ends are very similar to each other. And uh, we can compute that uh, their fundamental groups, uh, their knot groups are the same. So let's call this K, and let's call this K tilde. We can compute that the knot group of K is isomorphic to the knot group of K tilde. 
but uh, they are distinct from each other. They are not uh, equivalent knots. And we can prove it by using some polynomial, for example, the Jones polynomial. All right, I will show it uh, how we construct the Jones polynomial later on. So here is a limitation of the knot group, but for prime knots, it's almost complete, right? I mean, here is a corollary, the knot group. is complete for prime knots, but up to mirror symmetry. OK, it's quite powerful. I mean, uh, especially if we compare the knot group with the other numerical invariants that we discussed yesterday. Um, and here, if we go back to our question, uh, since it's the complete invariant, the knot group is a complete invariant for prime knots. Um, and if you compute the fundamental group of the trefoil here, the knot group of the trefoil, and if you see something different than Z, you can immediately uh, conclude that the trefoil is really knotted. It can't be trivialized. Okay, so we can make the computation after I just present the Wirtinger presentation of the knot group. Any questions? OK, so. Now it's time to uh, write down some planar presentation for the knot group so that it gets more computable for us, at least by hand. So now we are uh, passing to the projections of a knot. In the in a plane, uh, so and we assume a direction on the projections. Okay, we assume an orientation. So in this case, we may have two types of crossings on a diagram: positive or negative crossing. We discussed it yesterday as well. So here, what we have is like around each crossing, we see three arcs, right? I mean, these two arcs are broken into two. I mean, this is just one complete arc going underneath the uh, other strand, but we see, I mean, in the picture, this is an arc and this is another arc, and then this is another arc, so we see three arcs. Arc means here that a strand, a piece of strand that goes from an undercrossing till the next undercrossing, okay? So here, this arc started somewhere uh, at an undercrossing, and it just stopped here because uh, this is the next undercrossing for it. Okay, this is the terminal for this arc. So let's name this arc with xi and this arc with xj and xk. So it is intuitively clear that, um, I mean, going back to the definition of the uh, knot group, it is the loop space of the complement, right? So we took a base point and the loops surrounding, uh, wrapping around the overpassing strands when we look above to the uh, knot generates this uh, loop space, the fundamental group of the complement. So here, uh, if we consider a base point, okay, so each arc will generate a loop for the uh, fundamental group. So basically, we can just consider that um, here is a loop just wrapping around the xj arc, okay, so it's just going over, okay, and then it goes under and it just wraps around. And uh, I assume that the linking number of this orange loop that lies in the complement uh, of the knot is just having a linking number one with the arc xj. So there is an orientation here, so the orientation on the orange arc should be in this way, okay, so that the linking number here is plus one. Okay, this is the convention. So, and then I can uh, drop another uh, loop 
to the XI uh, arc. Just connects to the base point, right? And uh, to have linking number one, we orient this orange loop that lies in the complement in this direction. No, in the other direction, sorry. So it comes like this and goes back in this direction. So just emphasize that it goes over here. All right. And there is another loop in the complement that will wrap around the third arc here, right? So uh, how do we draw that? It comes like this and it goes back underneath. Okay. And the orientation should be uh, in this direction. So it goes from the it, uh, sources from the base point and it goes back to the base point, all right? So that the linking number here is plus one. So for the negative crossing, we can think the same, right? I mean, there are some loops wrapping around these three arcs here that I call xi, xj, and xk. I don't want to draw the picture again. Uh, but when you consider these knots, uh, these loops, sorry, in a lying in a complement, at every crossing, there will be a relation coming that they can be turned into the trivial uh, loop and you can just get rid of the loop in the complement by some combination. So here is the relation at a positive crossing. So uh, if you take the uh, inverse of xj loop and join it to xi and then to xj and to the inverse of xk loop, I mean, uh, each loop here is named in the same way with the arc, it's wrapping, okay? So this is the xj loop here, maybe I should also write, and this is the xi loop and xk loop, all right? So the relation says that if you take this combination, it, it is just giving the trivial loop in the complement, all right? It's just uh, a loop that is shrinkable. So to see this, you need to really uh, make some drawings, all right? So you start with the inverse of uh, the J to loop here. So it goes this direction, but here the inverse will start from the base point and it just wraps uh, over the XJ arc, comes here. Then you connect it with the XI arc. So you see when you take the connection here, um, there will be some uh, undoing here, I think. Did I make it correctly? Let's see. So you go this way. This is the inverse of xj. And then you need to combine it with xi. Mm, going in this direction, but maybe it would be better to draw it in this way. So, I mean, it is isotopic in the end. So that there will be some part lying all over and you can just undo that part and then you connect it with the xj again and xk inverse and you will see that you get rid of the loop it's something uh, trivial do you do you want me to try this right now i, I don't want to draw the pictures but uh, it's a good exercise and for the ne uh, negative crossings uh, for for a negative crossing we have a very similar relation coming and it's just a uh, given as follows. So it is xj, xi, xj inverse, xk inverse is giving us the identity loop. So let me write that these are left as an exercise to show that uh, this really halt these relations. So here Wirtinger's idea was to present the knot group uh, as a free group uh, given by n generators uh, relating or corresponding to n arcs on a knot diagram. And there is a relation set, right? I and mean, you take the quotient with a normal subgroup 
uh, generated by these relations uh, that are induced by at the crossings of the knot diagram. So let me write R1 up to R1. So if, we have, if you have n crossings in a knot diagram, you will have n arcs. So there will be n generators coming. Uh, there will be n crossings so that there will be n generators coming. But you can show by a small exercise again uh, that uh, one relation is also always a redundant so that you can drop one of the relations. So this is the Wirtinger presentation. of the knot group. Okay. So you see, I mean, you are just working with uh, an oriented knot diagram, oriented diagram of a knot, and you consider each arc or each uh, overpassing strand as a, a generator in this presentation. And at each crossing, we have these two, uh, at each crossing, we have one of these two relations. So here I will make an introduction. So uh, the first polynomial that was given in history for knots uh, was in 1920s again, and it was given by Alexander. So the first polynomial, the first knot polynomial uh, by Alexander, James Alexander. Um, I guess it was 1928 or around this uh, year. And um, Alexander's construction was quite combinatorial, but it was understood by himself as well, like by him, that uh, it is related to the homology group of the uh, complement of the knot, of the fundamental group of the uh, complement of the knot. So quite a combinatorial construction that we will present uh, tomorrow in tomorrow's lecture. But uh, here uh, behind this polynomial, which we call the Alexander polynomial, there are some topological observations going on. And then uh, after this date, there was no other knot polynomial coming until 60s. Uh, Conway defined a polynomial that we call now Conway-Alexander polynomial by a local relation uh, that can, I mean, it, it is like, it can be calculated recursively depending on the relation that I will present in tomorrow's lecture as well. Uh, but then it was understood that uh, Conway's polynomial is just giving the Alexander polynomial. It's just a normalized version of it. So it wasn't something different. But Conway's uh, technique or tool uh, to construct this polynomial was quite uh, improving, let's say, because uh, he introduced skein relations. Skein relation idea. Actually, a skein relation uh, or a local relation that relates some polynomials to each other was firstly observed by Alexander, uh, but it wasn't really like um, studied along, let's say. So we uh, cite Conway when we mention skein relation for a polynomial. Generally, we credit Conway, Conway's work. So uh, later, uh, after 60s, okay, Conway gave this construction and it was understood it is just the normalized version of the Alexander polynomial. Uh, until 80s, there was no other knot polynomial introduced. But in 80s, Wolfgang Jones introduced the Jones polynomial, and it was a breakthrough in knot theory. It's first of all, I mean, after a long time, after this date, uh, it was the first uh, new polynomial introduced for knots and links. And also, his work uh, related um, 
some operator algebras or diagrammatic algebras to braid groups that we study in knot theory. Also, then it opened up a path uh, in between knot theory and quantum field theories and topological quantum field theories. Uh, actually, Jones gave a construction. Uh, his original construction was based on uh, the observation that the algebras that he was working on, uh, called von Neumann algebras, uh, they can be represented or uh, they can be related with braid groups and then with some trace uh, map he uh, extracted his polynomial but then uh, in similar uh, that like in like one or two years later Kaufman, Louis Kaufman gave the bracket polynomial description for the Jones polynomial using Kaufman brackets So it was quite a combinatorial description to obtain this polynomial. Uh, and then, uh, again, I mean, during these years, Edward Witten gave a three-dimensional reformulation or formulation of the Jones polynomial. So here, Edward Witten. He described the Jones polynomial through, a Feynman, through the Feynman path integral. in uh, 3D space, let's say. So uh, here, there, I mean, there are some uh, ways to construct this polynomial. In uh, today's lecture, I will be talking about the bracket polynomial construction. Uh, Witten's work and the Jones uh, work uh, on Jones polynomial uh, got the Fields Medal in 1991. Fields Medal. 1991 and Kaufman's work uh, the construction of the Jones polynomial through bracket polynomial was quite also like made this polynomial or made these constructions easy to understand uh, or made um, the computation of the polynomial easy to understand. Uh, here we have a path integral definition for the Jones polynomial but it's a uh, I mean, it gives a physical insight to us about the uh, Jones polynomial, but some topological uh, insight is missing there. Also, it's hard to compute. And the original construction of Jones uh, polynomial is not really uh, giving us something computable. Uh, but the bracket with the bracket polynomial, we can really easily uh, compute the Jones polynomial. So I guess uh, I want to give a break right now and we can uh, continue uh, with the bracket polynomial in the second hour. So, I mean, I just very briefly talked about the original construction that, I mean, it was just a story, right? I mean, uh, Wolfgang Jones was in operator algebras in that field of research. And then uh, there is this braid groups that has some generators and the relations. He observed the similarity between uh, these two algebraic structures and he wrote out uh, a representation from the braid group to the operator algebras that he was working on. So I won't be going into the um, original construction, rather I just, wanted, I just want to give or list the axioms of the Jones polynomial. So you can take these axioms as a way to compute the Jones polynomial. Let's write it. So let's K being oriented, I, I put the arrow here, K being oriented, not our main diagram. Then the Jones polynomial uh, is the unique, we denote it by V of K, K is the unique Lorentz polynomial with integer coefficients uh, that satisfies 
the following three properties. The first one is if k is equivalent to k prime, equivalent means m being the isotopic here, or orientation preserving homeomorphism, okay, in the strict sense. If uh, k is equivalent to k prime, then the first axiom says that the Jones polynomials will be the same. Okay. So it is given in T. All right. So the second one, the Jones polynomial of the trivial knot is equal to one. Okay. And the third axiom, is the skein relation of the Jones polynomial uh, that is a local relation that will um, connect three polynomials of three different links to each other, okay? So this is the relation that I will just write. The inverse times the Jones polynomial of a link that we see locally as a positive crossing, all right? So this is the, uh, this is the local picture of a whole uh, link all right, or a knot. So in this picture, we see just a unique crossing, okay? And it's a positive crossing. Minus t times the Jones polynomial of the link that we obtain after changing this crossing here of the initial link to a negative crossing, okay? So here in this uh, operation, we see two link diagrams, okay, local ones here, and they, they are just related to each other, or they are just changing from each other at a unique crossing, okay? Uh, the rest of these two knots or links are the same. So this should be equal to squared of t minus one over squared of t times uh, the Jones polynomial of a link that we obtain by just smoothing this crossing of the link, all right, in the oriented way. So this is called the skein relation of the Jones polynomial. So as you see, I mean, in this uh, relation, we observe three different links, right? So here uh, in this picture, we have a link that has at least one positive crossing, all right? In this second link, if we call this L plus, uh, this second link uh, is obtained by changing the crossing here to a negative crossing, but the rest of this link uh, is the same with L plus. I will call this L minus. And here we obtain a third link by just uh, smoothing out this crossing here in the oriented way, which means that we just delete the crossing, okay? Maybe I shouldn't, I should make picture here. So here is uh, the local picture of my first link here. So what I do is I just delete this crossing, all right? Then I do uh, connect the remaining endpoints here in oriented way so that the resulting object, which is possibly a link, uh, is oriented compatibly, all right? So if these two uh, objects here are knots, then you will resolve that knot here, right? At that crossing. So you may obtain a link in the, for the third uh, object after smoothing out. So this operation here can increase the number of components. So let's call this oriented smoothing, oriented smoothing, okay? So, and the scaling relation says that the Jones polynomial of L plus times T inverse minus the Jones polynomial of L minus times T is equal to this term here in uh, squared of T times the Jones polynomial of the third link that we obtain after smoothing a unique crossing here in L plus, all right, in the oriented way. All right, I mean, it is not just uh, 
it, I mean, this list of properties are giving an uh, axiomatic way to calculate the Jones polynomial, right? I mean, it doesn't really say that there exists such a polynomial. It says that the Jones polynomial is the unique polynomial satisfying these properties. That if we have two equivalent knots, their Jones polynomial will be the same. It is just the trivial uh, value on the unknot. Which, uh, the, I mean, it gets one uh, for the unknot. And then we have this uh, scaling relation. And the Jones polynomial of any knot or link uh, can be calculated, calculated by using these three properties, three axioms. Because when we apply at crossings, at a sequence of crossings, these uh, crossing exchanges and uh, smoothings, we will undo the diagram in the end. So we will have some number of circular components coming and then we know the value on the circle, right? It is, I mean, uh, it's a result uh, coming from the observation that any knot can be turned into a knot by a sequence of uh, crossing changes by making some crossings from under to over or over to under. I mean, by just modifying the crossing information drastically, you can undo any knot. Of course, I mean, this is not an equivalence, right? I mean, it's not an allowed deformation. It's, it's a, a harsh modification on the combinatorics of the knot. All right, so let's make an example maybe by using uh, these axioms. Let's calculate, uh, for example, some links Jones polynomial. All right, so which one I should use maybe? I want to compute, for example, the Jones polynomial of the unlink with two components, right? So here is the question. So how do I compute it? Because the axioms uh, do not tell me that, do not tell me directly the value of this object here. And it's, or, it's an oriented link. So what's the value here? So what I can do is I can just, you know, utilize uh, the skin relation and the information here. And of course the first property. So let's see how do I do that. Uh, so I can just put a crossing here, connecting these two components, right? So I can obtain this, not, all right, and it's a positive crossing, right? So I know that T inverse times the Jones polynomial of this knot here minus T times the Jones polynomial of the knot that I can obtain by exchanging the crossing information here to a negative one. Is equal to squared of T minus one over square root of t times the Jones polynomial of the link that I'm searching, uh, that I'm uh, looking for its uh, Jones polynomial, right? And all right, so this, the skin relation tells me that these three polynomials are related in this way, then I can utilize the first property, right? It says that if two knots are equivalent to each other, then the Jones polynomials should be the same. And these are uh, easy to see, these two knots are easy to see that they are equivalent to a knot, right? You can just undo these uh, kings here by Rydermeister one moves. So the Jones polynomial here of this knot will be equal to one by the first property and the second one. And also this one is equal to one, again, by the same reasoning. And now what we have is the Jones polynomial of this unlink is equal to t inverse minus t over square root of t minus one over square root of t. Okay. Okay. Easy example, but it is quite picturing what uh, the axioms are saying to us.
So actually, I mean, uh, the Kane relation gives us, with this property, gives us a recursive uh, way to calculate the Jones polynomial. But the question here is, of course, I mean, if such a polynomial exists, it will be the unique polynomial satisfying these properties, right? But the existence is not quite very explicit here with this description of the Jones polynomial. Uh, what can be the construction uh, for this polynomial? So one of the constructions, uh, as I just uh, mentioned in the beginning of my uh, lecture, is the bracket polynomial, and we can talk about it right now. Maybe I just erase here. So the bracket polynomial is sometimes uh, named as Kaufman bracket. Um, so it's an exchangeable name. So here uh, we work with diagrams of knots or links, all right? But uh, there will be no direction on our diagram. So we assume unoriented diagrams. So a crossing locally will look like uh, uh, with I mean, it, it crossing can be represented with one of these pictures, right? So here, what we see, I mean, combinatorially, I mean, we can, if we consider these crossings as vertices, this vertex here is neighboring or adjacent or incident to four local regions, right? And also this one. So around each crossing, we see four local pictures, uh, four local regions. So we can make a partition uh, on this for local regions. So the convention is the following. You have this overpassing strand here, all right? You start moving it in a counterclockwise direction. And the regions, these two regions that are swapped, will be A regions, okay? So I will call these two regions uh, A type regions. I will just label them as in A. And the other regions here, are labeled as B. So I can just apply this convention to this crossing as well. I start moving the overpassing strand in the counterclockwise direction, and two regions will be swapped, all right, shaded. And here in this picture, the A regions will be the regions uh, in the horizontal, right? And these are the B regions. So I have this partition on these four uh, local regions at every crossing. In the global picture, they may be, for example, these regions or uh, a pair of regions can be the same region in the global picture. But uh, in the local uh, picture, we have this picture. So, okay, what do I gain from here? So the idea uh, behind the bracket polynomial is just to smooth uh, to smooth the, cro uh, smooth the crossing, okay? So, here, I can smooth this crossing in two ways. In, I mean, smoothing means that deleting that crossing, all right? So if I delete this crossing, I obtain some arcs with open ends, but I don't want it, I want connectivity. So in the end, I can just uh, connect these endpoints here with each other in the horizontal way, all right? Or in the vertical way, right? So there are two ways to smooth out uh, a crossing. And I will call uh, one, of the cro uh, one of the smoothings that will connect the A regions together, A smoothing, all right? So this will be called A smoothing here, smoothing. And the other is B smoothing. And the final pictures will be looking like this. So I had this 
crossing here in the initial picture, then I smooth it out to connect the regions labeled with A. All right? So this is the vertical smoothing you can also call. And the B smoothing just connects the B regions together. All right? I get a horizontal smoothing. And in the other type of crossing here, I can do the same. And B type smoothings I have, maybe I should just uh, draw here. Maybe here. OK, A and B. So in this picture, to connect the A regions together, I have this type of smoothing. And to connect the B regions together, I have this kind of smoothing, all right? So the roles of uh, connections are uh, exchanging here with respect to the type of the crossing. Okay. So in the end, if I have a, a diagram of a knot with n crossings, at each crossing, I have two possibilities to smooth that uh, knot's crossing. So uh, in the end, I will have two to the n possibilities, right, in total for the given diagram. OK, uh, so the idea is smooth all crossings of k in two possible ways. And in the end, when we smooth out each crossing, what we get is a set of, a collection of loops, right, in the play. So you, had a, uh, you have a knot diagram, then you start deleting the crossings, all right, by preserving some connectivity uh, property. So in the end, you will have either a loop or a kind of, uh, a number of loops in the play. If you apply smoothing, at every crossing. And we will have two to the n loop configurations, which we will call states of k. So I will make a I will give an example to explain it in a better way. So let's start obtaining the states of the trefoil knot diagram that has three crossings. So we expect eight states, right? So each crossing has two possible ways to, smooth, to be smoothed. In the end, we will have eight possible states. So let's start with one crossing, with a chosen crossing, okay? So it doesn't matter which crossing you start. Uh, I just apply two possible smoothings at the chosen crossing. Okay, maybe I should just circle the crossing with this color. Okay, so maybe I should mention uh, here, I should label the local regions. If I move the overpassing strand here in this picture, I will just shade uh, or swap uh, these two regions, right? These are the A regions. And these two regions are the B regions, all right? So the A-type smoothing in this crossing gives me the horizontal smoothing. So I have this picture. So I delete the crossing here, the chosen crossing, and I connect the uh, endpoints, resulting endpoints in a horizontal way to connect the A regions together. Okay? So you see, I get rid of one of the crossings here uh, in this diagram. I reduce the case that I have two crossings here uh, by the A smoothing. And by the B smoothing, uh, I will have again a two crossing diagram, but in a different configuration. So it will be the vertical smoothing to connect the B regions, okay? So actually I have a half link here, all right? Here it's equivalent to 
I'm not, but that's okay, I'm in optimal. So, all right, we still have uh, uh, crossings to smooth, right? Uh, I choose one another crossing, okay, to get rid of it. And I have two ways to smooth this crossing, right? And B smoothing way. So let me just uh, label the regions. Here are the A regions and these are the B regions. Okay, so, so from the A smoothing I obtain a component here and another component here. So I disconnect the diagram by the A smoothing and the B smoothing still preserves the connectivity on the loop. So I have this picture, right? Maybe I should just add this information that to keep that there was a crossing there before. So here is a crossing, here is a crossing place, and here there was a crossing, um, and there was a crossing here as well, in between, okay? And I go like this. Let me uh, go into the other picture here, uh, the Hoffling picture. So I choose this crossing, and I have two ways to smooth it, A and B. And uh, in the... A-type smoothing, I connect these two uh, regions together so that I obtain um, this picture. Okay. And uh, the B-type smoothing gives me the vertical smoothing here, which is just... this configuration. Okay, so I had the crossing here and the crossing here. All right, so you see, I mean, one by one, we resolve all the crossings and uh, we are left with this loop configurations in the step uh, with one crossing, right? I mean, there is one, uh, one more step to be done. So I, mean, uh, I choose this crossing and I start smoothing it out in two ways, A and B. So these are the A regions and the others are B regions. So uh, the A type smoothing reduces this configuration or increases the number of loops and gives me this configuration. All right. So here are the crossing placements. And the B type smoothing gives me a loop and another loop. Okay. So, oops, maybe. Okay, and uh, we apply the same procedure uh, to this crossing here and we will have two uh, descendants coming from these and two descendants coming from this configuration and two descendants coming from this, uh, from this configuration. So in the end, we will have eight possible descendants of the trefoil knot diagram, right? And we will call these final descendants as states, okay? They are like... Uh, each state is a collection of loops and uh, there, there is no crossing. States. Okay. So the definition of the polynomial, the bracket polynomial is based on summing up uh, the values of these loops uh, with the smoothing information uh, coming as coefficients. So I just described the polynomial here. Maybe I should give some definitions. Define the weight of a state that I will denote by S, all right? As the product of labels in smoothings uh, that are used to obtain that state, all right? So for example, this is state one that I obtain in this picture. This is state two, and there will be eight more, uh, there will be six more steps, uh, 
states. And this state is obtained by three sequential A smoothings, right? So here, uh, I will get the weight of that state as the product of these labels. So the weight of the first state will be uh, A cube, all right? So let's write here the product of smoothing labels uh, to obtain S, I can say. So here's an example. So for the trefoil knot diagram that I just draw there. So the first state has three loops. And I oh, the weight that I assign to this state is A cube. Okay? And the weight that I assign to the second state here is the product of the smoothing label. So A and uh, it goes like uh, A here and then B here, oh, sorry, A, uh, A and B, A squared times B, all right? Okay, and I define the norm of a state S as uh, the number of loops in S minus one. So, an example, the norm of this state here that I call maybe as S1. So, for the trefoil knot diagram, the state of the trefoil S1 has norm how many loops? We have three loops, its norm is two, all right? Okay, so by these components, I will describe the polynomial now, definition. The bracket polynomial of k is given as the sum of uh, the values that I assign to the state. So it's given as the following sum. So we just sum over the states. states of k so here uh, inside the sum uh, I have the weight information that I assign to each state and I have the loop information right d here is a variable for the polynomial that counts the loops in that state and the summation is going along or among the a uh, collection of states of k, all right? So in the end, we will have a polynomial uh, with variables a, b, and d, all right? Here, d is an abstract variable that I will uh, specialize it, but I can write this. The notation of the bracket polynomial is given with this bracket, and it's a polynomial in A, B, and D. Okay. Now, I mean, you can take it as an exercise to compute the bracket polynomial of the trefoil here. Just, you know, the weight of S1, we computed A, A cube, and you will multiply it with the norm information, D square. Right, okay, the contribution of S1 is a cubed times d squared, plus then the contribution coming from the second state and the third and the eighth one, right? You sum up all these values to obtain the bracket polynomial in three variables, a, b, and d. Actually, in this form, the bracket polynomial is not yet a not invariant, unfortunately. It is just an abstract polynomial that we can assign uh, to a given knot or a linked diagram, right? So, what are the conditions to obtain an invariant out of this description? We have to check what happens under Rydomeister moves, right? 
I mean, uh, with this we have this definition and we can check if it is uh, remaining the same under Rydermeister moves, but we see that it is not, and there, is some con there are some conditions coming for it uh, to stay the same under Rydermeister moves. So let's write the integral. The bracket polynomial. Okay. Is invariant under Rydermeister two and Rydermeister three moves if uh, a time a is equal to or b is equal to a inverse and d is equal to minus a square minus uh, a to the minus two. So if you choose the value, uh, if you assign these uh, conditions to the variables d and b, you obtain an invariant uh, up to regular isotopy. Okay? It is still not an invariant under the first Rydermeister move. We can check it. But if you impose that it needs to stay invariant or unchanged under Rydermeister 2 and 3, you can see that from diagrams that we need to impose these conditions on, a, uh, on b and d. Okay, so let's see. Uh, maybe I should make a note here. So if you assume that B is equal to A inverse, in the end what we get is a Lorentz polynomial, right? It may have uh, some negative uh, uh, degree terms inside. So I will write this. The bracket polynomial of a knot gives us a Lorentz polynomial and in A and A inverse with uh, integer coefficients. So the question is, what happens under Rydermeister 1? So let's see what happens. So I want to compute, calculate the bracket polynomial of some link diagram, all right? And it looks locally as this picture, all right? It has a king inside. So here there's one crossing to go, all right, to smooth. And here are the A regions and here are the B regions. So I have here A times this part of the strand. It connects together to connect the A regions. And I have a loop, right? Maybe I should check this uh, verification later, but I just want to write it now. Maybe in it. So I have this and A inverse, this picture. Okay. So what I obtain when I smooth uh, this crossing in the uh, way to connect to the A regions, I have this. Uh, two local pictures, that is a loop, one of them, and I have the connectivity in the, uh, coming from the other type of smoothing, right? And here, uh, the weight is multiplied by A. I just uh, take it out, right? And here the weight is, I mean, here it comes from the B type smoothing, but I assume that B is equal to A inverse, all right? So here, uh, what I can do is, a loop is uh, valued as D, right? Because I have to make a note here, maybe. So I can take this uh, loop out and multiply this coefficient by d. And what I have is a trivial strand inside and the inverse times a trivial strand inside, right? So these are isotopic. So in the end, what I have is a times d plus a inverse the bracket of this strand, right? And uh, these assume to be this value. So when I make the calculation, I obtain that there is a multiplicative factor here that comes up. 
So here is one picture of a link diagram, right? That has a kink here, and it, it's polynomial. The bracket polynomial is related to this link diagram without any kinks with this factor, right? So they are not really the same. So we say that, all right, the bracket doesn't stay the same on the Rydermeister one. It multiplies the polynomial of the initial diagram by this term to obtain the latter uh, diagram that we obtain after the move. So the idea is that we can make use of uh, the right, okay, that we discussed uh, yesterday in our lecture. So the right is also changing the uh, diagram uh, information, right? I mean, if we add a king to a diagram, the right is changing by plus one or minus one. So here is a Rydermeister one more happening, all right, applied to a link diagram. And there is a change here, a multiplicative change. So, but there is a way to cancel this change by using the right. Okay, so let's do that. So we normalize the bracket of k by the right factor. Which is equal to minus a cube to minus of right of k. Okay. So here uh, there is a transition. We obtain the bracket polynomial of a knot uh, by utilizing uh, unoriented diagrams of the knot, right? I mean, there is no orientation here to obtain the bracket. But here, we have said that we will just normalize or cancel out this error factor by utilizing the right factor, right? By using the right. But the right is calculated over oriented diagrams. So here the orientation comes into the scene and we need to consider some orientation on our diagrams to obtain something invariant. So k is oriented now. And let's see how right is changing our diagram information again. So let's give, an inform uh, let's give a direction on the diagram. So here, the right of this diagram, oriented diagram, is related to the right of this diagram without any kinks in this way, right? We add uh, a negative crossing by right of my one. And the right of this diagram is related to the right of this diagram that is before and after before or after the Rydermeister one move in this way, right? So we know these relations, we already observed this yesterday. And I define now uh, the normalized version of the bracket polynomial as follows, well so it will be uh, the polynomial multiplied the bracket polynomial multiplied by this factor. Then, this is called the normalized bracket polynomial. And it's an invariant of oriented knots and links. Okay? So we cancel out this factor here that I say error factor that comes from a Rydermeister one move, okay, with uh, the right information of the oriented diagram. Then it becomes also invariant under Rydermeister one moves. Here is a theorem. 
the normalized bracket polynomial is an invariant of oriented knots and links. Okay, so the good thing is, all right, we just uh, get the bracket polynomial in a very combinatorial way. It's uh, fortunately invariant under Rademeister 2 and 3 with these assumptions over variables. And we can normalize the factor here uh, that comes after or before a Rademeister 1 move applied on a diagram by the right information. Uh, on the diagram, right? When it is given an orientation. And we get an invariant. And we can show that this invariant that we call the normalized bracket polynomial is the Jones polynomial, actually, with some substitution uh, for the variable a here. So let's try to show it right now. So I just erase here. So first, a proposition maybe, it's good to see this. So the uh, bracket polynomial also satisfies a scanning relation, okay? The scanning relation tells that the bracket of this diagram is equal to A times the bracket of this diagram plus A inverse times uh, the bracket of this diagram, okay? I use this implicitly here, right? Without proving it. It is a local relation relating these three polynomials to each other by some uh, coefficients in A and A inverse. Okay, so the proof of uh, this proposition is quite straightforward. I mean, we can just observe uh, firstly that the states of this diagram locally given in uh, with this uh, crossing all right so there's this complete link diagram here and locally what we see is a unique crossing of that link diagram so all the states the collection of uh, all states of this diagram can be written as a disjoint union of the collection of states of this diagram and this diagram okay that we obtain after removing this crossing all right so the observation here states uh, of this diagram, possibly a link diagram, all right, is just the disjoint union of states of this diagram that I obtain after removing this crossing here, okay, and states, maybe I just write this, of this diagram. So this means that if I want to compute the bracket polynomial of this diagram here, which is, um, uh, which is a sum over all states, I can just break that sum into two parts, right? As a sum over the states of this uh, diagram and plus uh, the sum over the states of this diagram. So what I can say is the bracket of this diagram is just equal to the sum over all states coming from this diagram, of course, but I can write it as a, in two parts, this sum now. So I can write that plus But what is missing here is that, of course, I have an extra uh, crossing here comparing this uh, diagram with these two diagrams that I can obtain by deleting this crossing, right? And when I smooth it in one way or another way, there will be some coefficients coming, right? Every smoothing contributes to the weight. 
it multiplies the weight by A or A inverse. So here this diagram is obtained by A smoothing, right? So here if you consider this diagram states, there is some term missing in the weight production, right? It is A. So I need to add here the A coefficient in front and here uh, B smooth, I mean this diagram is obtained uh, by the B smoothing of this crossing, all right? So the term B is missing in the weight calculation. So I need to put here B or since we are working with an invariant right now, it should be A inverse, okay? Then we obtain this proposition. Here the summation gives me uh, the bracket of this uh, diagram and here the summation gives me the bracket of this diagram and we have these uh, multiplicative terms here, A and A inverse. But uh, the proposition is based on this obser uh, observation. I mean, the states of the initial diagram can be written as the disjoint union of the states of the first diagram and the second one. Oops. All right, so let's write the main theorem that the normalized bracket polynomial is indeed giving us the Jones polynomial. But I need to consider the variable as t to the minus 1 over 4 here instead of a, then I get the Jones polynomial. Okay. okay. So how do we prove this theorem? Okay, we know uh, the definition I mean, we may use the definition of the normalized bracket polynomial right now, and we know the axioms of the Jones polynomial, right? I mean, we didn't describe it explicitly, but we say that Jones polynomial is the unique polynomial satisfying some three properties, right? We listed them. So what we can do now by utilizing the definition of the normalized bracket polynomial, we need to show that it satisfies the skin relation of the Jones polynomial. That's what we need to do. It suffice to show that uh, bracket polynomial satisfies the skin relation of the Jones polynomial. Okay. Then we make a substitution for the variable to turn A into uh, the variable uh, for the Jones polynomial. It's something secondary. So let's show it. All right, so what I have here from this proposition, let me just rewrite it. So I have already a local relation relating these three diagrams to each other, right? Uh, relating the bracket polynomials of these three diagrams. So I know that the bracket polynomial of the initial diagram is equal to A times the bracket of this diagram that I obtained by deleting this crossing in the vertical way, plus A inverse, the bracket of the diagram that I obtained by deleting this crossing out from this diagram in the horizontal way, okay? And I have, of course, uh, this local relation for the other type of crossing. So this time the coefficients will uh, change here. Uh, I have A times the diagram obtained by the horizontal smoothing plus A inverse times the diagram that I obtained by the vertical smoothing. Okay, so I have these two local relations for the bracket polynomial. And what I can do here, I just want to uh, uh, pass 
to the world of oriented uh, links, right? I mean, I need to assume some orientation to go to the normalized uh, bracket polynomial and the Jones polynomial eventually. So what I can do is, uh, if I assume some orientation, for example, on this piece of strands here, this is a positive crossing, this is a negative crossing. So I can just make some tricks here to cancel some uh, terms out. And here I will have these orientations, right, on these horizontal smoothings. But you see, I mean, these are disoriented smoothings here. The orientations are not compatible. So I can just cancel them out uh, by just multiplying each row by some coefficients, right? So the terms that I want to kill are here and here. Okay, these terms are to be killed. So I just multiply this row by A, maybe by another color, and this row by A inverse. Okay. And then I, uh, I will apply a subtraction. I will subtract the first uh, row from the uh, second one. Okay. So what I have here is A times the bracket of the initial diagram whose crossing that we see here inside the bracket is a positive one minus A inverse, the bracket of this diagram whose crossing that we see in the, inside this picture is a negative one is equal to so I just multiply uh, every term by a, so this will make a square, all right? And this will uh, make one. And uh, when I make the subtraction, uh, these two terms are canceling each other out. So what I have is a square minus uh, a to the minus two, right? Times the bracket of this oriented diagram, okay? So this is almost looking like the skein relation of the Jones polynomial, right? But remember, the bracket polynomial is not yet uh, an invariant, but the Jones polynomial is an invariant, we know that. The first axiom of the Jones polynomial says that if two knots are equivalent to each other, the values, the Jones polynomials of them will be the same, all right? So here, uh, I should find out, I mean, I should uh, reach to the normalized bracket polynomial by some right correction, right? What I can do, I, I will just, you know, apply some uh, arithmetical tricks here. I can multiply every term by minus a cube to the minus right of this diagram, okay? So I assume that the right of this diagram, let's write it here without any crossings in this local picture, is uh, say W, okay, just, it's a number. I don't know. And the right of this diagram, since it differs from this diagram by just a positive crossing, it is W plus one, right? Then the right, uh, of this diagram here is W plus 1. And the right of this diagram is uh, W minus 1, right? So if you know the right of this uh, diagram, you can uh, write the rights of these diagrams in terms of the right of the diagram without any crossings here. Okay, so what I will do is I will multiply every compound of this uh, relation by uh, the right correction of this diagram, okay? So just multiply every term by minus a cube to the minus w, all right? So what I have is, let's write it here. So I will have A times, uh, let me call this base as alpha, okay? 
it will be nicer to write alpha to minus w times the bracket of this diagram minus a inverse the bracket of sorry alpha to the minus w times the bracket of this diagram it's equal to alpha to the uh, minus w and let me call this d tilde okay the bracket of this diagram okay so i obtained that uh, this relation right now this identity relating these three polynomials to each other okay and i know that here uh, alpha to the minus right times the bracket of this uh, diagram is equal to the normalized bracket polynomial of this diagram right i can observe this and um, i can rewrite these uh, terms here to uh, find or to extract the normalized bracket polynomials of these diagrams as well. So what I will do is I will rewrite these multiplications here. Uh, let me cheat a little bit as a times alpha, okay, times alpha to the minus w plus one, okay, so that they cancel out. I, I, I do no, no change here times the bracket here minus a inverse times mm. alpha inverse times alpha to the minus w minus one the bracket of this diagram is equal to uh, d tilde times alpha to the minus w the bracket of this diagram okay and what I see is this part is giving me the normalized bracket polynomial of this diagram because in the end alpha to the minus w plus 1, this is the right of this diagram, is the uh, right correction uh, for the bracket polynomial, right? And here I said in the beginning that this diagram's right is just w minus 1 and this here is the right correction uh, of the bracket polynomial of this diagram. So this gives me, I should use white, the normalized bracket polynomial of this diagram. And here I get the normalized bracket polynomial of this diagram with a positive crossing in the picture, okay? And I have these uh, parts as well to calculate, all right? And here I have the normalized bracket polynomial of this diagram, okay? So when I do the calculations, I see that if I didn't do something wrong, I see that I have minus a to the 4, the normalized bracket polynomial of this diagram, minus, uh, plus, sorry, a to the minus 4, the normalized bracket polynomial of the second diagram is equal to uh, a square minus uh, a to the minus 2, the normalized bracket polynomial of this diagram. Okay? And when I assume a is equal to t to the minus 1 over 4, I get the scaling relation for the Jones polynomial. Okay? So that's the and of the proof of this statement actually. So we can extract uh, the Jones polynomial uh, in this way by using the bracket polynomial and the normalized version of it by this substitution. So these calculations uh, I think they need to be checked because in the end I, I might have made a mistake here uh, in my calculations, but I mean, the proof is based on the local relations or scaling relations of the bracket polynomial and uh, by some, I mean, applying some arithmetical tricks here.
Okay, so what we have shown is actually we have proven the existence of the Jones polynomial, right? I mean, I just uh, set out some axiom list uh, that are helpful for us to compute the Jones polynomial. I say that if such a polynomial exists, it is unique, satisfying these properties. And here is the definition of that polynomial, right? I mean, the, bracket, uh, the normalized bracket polynomial is uh, the way we define the Jones polynomial. I mean, it's a definition for it. It's a closed definition, not with axioms. So the existence is proven here as well. So there are some nice properties of the Jones polynomial. For example, it can uh, capture the mirror symmetry. It can distinguish the trefoil, right-handed trefoil knot from the left-handed trefoil knot. Um, because you can see easily from the bracket smoothing. Maybe I should raise here. So let's draw a crossing. And when I apply a mirror symmetry here, it is crossing. So the crossing is uh, changing in this way, right? If I reflect this crossing along a vertical line in the plane. So you can see the roles of, uh, I mean, the positioning of the A and B regions are swapped. Here in this picture, A regions are the horizontal ones, okay? And B regions are here, but in this picture, a regions are here and B regions are here. So the bracket is changing with this variable change uh, with respect to the mirror symmetry. So if the polynomial, the Jones polynomial um, of a knot is not symmetric under this change, then you can capture uh, the information, the chirality information from the Jones polynomial of the knot. So, as a corollary, I will write it. So this trefoil knot diagram, or this trefoil here, is not the same as its mirror image. Maybe give an orientation also. Okay. You can calculate the Jones polynomial of the uh, this is left-handed, I guess. Um, yes. Uh, you can co calculate the Jones polynomial of the left-handed trefoil and see that it is different than the Jones polynomial of the right-handed trefoil. So we introduced the knot polynomial in the beginning of the lecture. It was a powerful invariant, but it wasn't able to distinguish uh, mirror images of knots, right? I mean, uh, if two knots are different, uh, it's not able to say that they are different, okay? It's just a complete invariant, but up to mirror symmetry. But Jones polynomial can distinguish uh, and not from its mirror image. Okay, I think that's the end of uh, the lecture today.